Okay. So we've uh, compared the uh, the models. Now the next thing is like, uh, have you heard of measurement invariance? Is it something you've come across? This term? Yes. Just uh, you mind explaining what do you think it? Uh, no, it's just, the term. You know the term. Yeah. So as you might guess from invariance, is basically this type of concept that we're measuring the same thing across different groups. So when I was talking in the beginning, so for example, when we develop an intelligence scale, we want to make sure it's the same, measuring the same thing if we go to a high SES school than a low SES school. So we want to make sure it's invariance. <laughs> same, for example, for diagnosing uh, people's stigma relating to different uh, conditions. You want to make sure that your stigma skill is measuring the same thing for, for example, people with diabetes, that is, it does for people with skin conditions, if you're uh, trying to capture that con uh, concept across a different range of uh, conditions. Yeah. So, basically, we want to find out what uh, measurement environments like. Is the pattern the same for groups? You can read more on that, uh, on that link. And so, you could have equal form. So, the number of factors and the pattern of factor indicators are identical across groups. You could have equal loadings, like the factor loadings are equal across groups. You could have equal intercepts. When observed scores are regressed on each factor, the intercepts are equal across those groups. And you could have equal residual variances. So that means the most uh, uh, stringent one, like the residual variances of the observed scores are not accounted for by the factors that are uh, for by the factors that are equal across groups. So all four of those are satisfied, you have strict measurement environment variance. That's the highest layer that we can attain. So it basically means the error which we make when taking the questionnaire to the, for example, rich school versus poor school is exactly the same. Yeah. In many scenarios, that will not be achievable. And we'll aim for something like, if we have a three-factor solution in school one, do we also have a three-factor solution in school two? Yeah. Rather than having a really stringent condition that all the error has to be the same distribution across all these different schools. Yeah. So that's the principles of measurement in that in, in variance. And so, so don't beat yourself up if you don't get strict measurement invariance because it's actually quite rare to capture in the wild. There's good reasons why, for example, schools would differ or why conditions would differ and why your measurement would not be exactly the same across all these groups. Yeah. But that's the golden standard and that's what you would be hoping for. Another example would be, for example, if you go across cultures and you're measuring personality dimensions, do you get the same six or five factors if we go to Southeast Asia compared to when we go to the UK? So that's also something which psychologists have addressed. And you're hoping to get something close to strict measurement environments, but sometimes you might just recover the same structure, like a big five structure across all these other uh, uh, cultures. So. In our example, we're going to compare if the three-factor structure is the same in both schools. I told you the data were from two schools. So are we measuring the same things in school A and school B? Yeah. So we make a group uh, model uh, one, and I could just call it group model one, but it's exactly the same structure. So if you were lazy, you could try and reuse it. But for clarity, I just call it group model one. And then I call something fit CFA group. And now the key difference is that I tell it it's group by school. Yeah. And so your example, it could be condition, it could be culture, it could be something else. The things you would like to compare are in there. So we get a massive output file, like a fit CFA group, and I'm going to run you through some of it. And then I'll just give you a quick overview, and then I'll run to you through it in, uh, in class. Again, it's from an earlier version. It doesn't matter. So you can see here that we had the Pasteur school and the Grant White school. So there are two, uh, two different schools. And then for each group, it will provide you the measurements. Uh, 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 it will provide you a chi-score. And then it will also give you the solutions for each group. Uh, so this is, some things are for the entire model, like the RMCA, they refer to the entire model. Some of the things are split out by group. And the most interesting bit, perhaps, is the parameter estimates. So you have the parameter estimates for the Pasteur school, and you have the parameter estimates for the Grand White school. And so in a perfect world, they would be exactly the same, and like we would get the same loadings if we go to Pasteur or if we go to Grant White. Yeah, so that's a massive, uh, massive output file. Again, it might be easier for us to visualize. So here is all the Grant White thing. So if you have, if you imagine that you have five cultures and five conditions, it's a really big, uh, big output file. Yeah, but I'm going to run you through how to evaluate these things in a, in a bit. But for now, this is sort of what it looks like. So 
we can plot a combined group uh, plot. Again, you won't be able to see this because it's quite condensed. And so it's the same code that we had before. But in this case, it will be combined groups is true. If we don't do that, then we get the groups split. So we get one for Pasteur and one for Grant White. Yeah. Again, you wouldn't be able to see this here, but you'd be able to evaluate and see whether the loadings on certain items are different for one school compared to the other school. Yeah, so there you have less bright green arrows than one versus the other. So now the actual measurement invariance uh, test. We use a package called SEMTools. You might, uh, I think it's still it's back up. It used to be offline, and otherwise you will have to use a legacy installer to install it like install GitHub as we've done before. So we'll look into it, but I think it's still available online or is it not available online? Uh, well, again, if it's not available online, I'll post you some CRAM codes to get to the legacy version, but perhaps it's not for the table bit. So we call some tools and we call this function, measurement invariance. We say which model it is and we tell it that it's grouped by school, and then it will do this measurement invariance uh, test, yeah? So basically, these correspond broadly to the four steps that we had before, and it will print AICs, BECs, and chi-square tests, uh, reporting to that. And there's some other output which is not printed, which is RMCAs, it will print for those models as well, yeah? Lots of output again. So model two is model, uh, is metric invariance, and that in layman's terms means respondents across groups attribute the same meaning to the latent construct under this uh, study. So if you were to do personality dimensions, it means that introversion, extroversion means the same in Asia as it does in the US. Yeah? So that's the lay interpretation. Model three is scalar variance. It means that the, uh, the meaning of a construct, the factor loadings, and the levels of the underlying items are equal in both groups. So consequently, the groups can be compared under scores on the latent variable. So in this case, the meaning is the same, but you can't really compare the scores across the different groups, yeah? So they might mean it the same thing, but in this case, we can use the latent variable scores to compare. And then we have strict invariance. This means that the explained variance for every item is the same across groups. So that's the most rigorous one. Put more strongly, so the latent construct is measured identically in each of the, so it means if you go to Asia or the US, openness is measured in exactly the same way using the same number of items, it doesn't matter, and it has the same type of error associated with it, yeah? So this is very difficult to achieve. You can read more here and here. Again, this is quite advanced and technical stuff. If you ever have to do this, take your time and go back and do some, uh, do some reading on this, yeah? So in this case, I'll come to the output in a bit. We can, uh, uh, I think it's side tabs, which is no longer uh, online. Centools is uh, online, but Site, site tabs you might have to install from GitHub, as you've done for some other packages in the past. So you might have to find a legacy version of it, either on the old CRAN, as you've done for BDA, when we had issues with it. So you might have to do the same thing for site tabs. But if that happens, just make me uh, just post on it, and then I'll give you some code as well. So we can make a little table for the, uh, for evaluating these, and so. Uh, Stargazer, unfortunately, doesn't change the labels if you want to have like complex labels, so I'll leave that for you to solve. But basically, we calculate the measurement invariance. We make a table, which with the command measurement invariance table from site tabs. And then we use Stargazer again to make a little output table for us. And you can find all the code here to change all the labels. And so if we go to measurement invariance, HTML. Again, it's opened it on the browser page. You'll end up something with this. So ideally, and this is the, the hard part. So in this case, we don't have the Greek symbols. We'd like to have had delta, chi-square, and all these other things. I know how to fix it. If you do the assessment uh, properly, you can uh, uh, like, or if you do the exercise properly, I'll show you how to fix it. But it's a uh, tough nut to crack. But you can play around with it for a little while. And so this, I've relabeled this configurable metrics color and uh, mean. And then you have the RMSCA, which wasn't printed before, the CFI. And then the BIC we've printed, it also prints the AIC. So I've selected some, but not everything. Yeah. 
So that's the, the output. Now, how do we interpret this type of uh, massive output? If we go back. So the issue there is that for a perfect table, you would like to have Greek symbols. You can adjust them manually in Word, or you can do the, uh, figure it out the hard way. So, so the best fitting model in both AIC and BC was one with metric invariance. So if we go back and look to our table, so metric, it has a BC of uh, 7680, and that's the lowest big that we have in this set. Yeah, so it's the closest bit. It isn't perhaps that much difference because it's only six units difference with the next one, and but it is somewhat different between those two. Yeah, and if you go back to the full output, you can see the AIC as well. Yeah, again, depending on your supervisor preferences, they will prefer Bayesian information criterions or Akiaki information criterions. So what you would write up is in both B, uh, B, uh, AIC and BIC. The one with the metric invariance is the best fit. In terms of RMCA, the model favored metric invariance as well, with strong invariance scoring the lowest. And again, you could go back and look at the actual table, and it will have the RMCA here. So the lowest RMCA is metric invariance. Yeah, and you can see that's the best fitting model. We go back. And so, C5 favorite is configurable, so I won't flip backwards and forwards, so you can run it for yourself, but the difference with the metric invariance is small. So in this case, your C5 would say something else. So okay, that also happens, so not all the criteria have to point to the same thing, because they weigh different things differently, like model complexity, and, uh, and yeah, mostly model complexity, like how many arrows you draw, yeah? And so, the metric invariance model is not uh, an adequate fit, in terms of RMCA, it is in CFI. So, so in absolute terms, we're not close to the 0 0.05 model, which we would like to have. So it's uh, it's lower than that. Uh, it's uh, higher than that. So it's a poor fit. Yeah. And so both the delta CFI and the delta RMCA suggested that you don't lose any fit if you move from configure to metric invariance. And so in conclusion here, you would say metric invariance is the best fit throughout these things. So if you go back and look at these, uh, at this model. you would conclude that based on RMCA, it's the, the best fit. I've not printed uh, the TLI, but you can see also in CFI, it's the best fit. To add this, uh, uh, well, configurable slightly better, but you don't lose fit if you go from one to the other. It's a marginal difference. Okay, so lots of complex output. And that's the type of write that people would typically do. So compare all these four models and say, this one is the best on this uh, metric, this one is uh, worse on this metric, and you also evaluate in absolute terms. Is it a very good fit in terms of absolute uh, measures? Does the RMCA, for example, go below 0 0.05, or is it quite a poor fit in terms of absolute terms? In this case, we find metric invariance, so that means the meaning is the same across both, uh, both groups. It doesn't mean we can compare all of them uh, directly, so we have this, same meaning, but it doesn't mean we can use the latent scores to compare Pasteur versus Grant White. And it's definitely not measuring the set, exact same thing in the Pasteur school and in the Grant White school, because in that case, we would have found strict invariance. Yeah. It's possible that the lack of measurement invariance is caused by just one or two items. So that you would have a way better model if you could just fix one or two items between the two groups. And so in this case, you could tell the model to allow uh, variation in one or two items. So Pasteur can have one item higher and the Grant White uh, thing. So obviously, if you allow all of them to vary, then it's no longer sensible, right? But if your measurement environment is being messed up by just one or two items, what statisticians then do is allow for partial invariance. So they say Pasteur and Grant White School can defer on the single item. And if you do that, you can read more here, then you have partial invariance. And sometimes that's the solution because it turns out there's this one item which is awkwardly placed and the Pasteur school interpreted in a different way than the Grant White school. And so if we had fixed that, we would have had perfect uh, invariance. Yeah. So that's it for today. So you're going to do an exercise with the Big Five uh, data and uh, you're going to build a Big uh, Five factor model in Lavan. So the Big Five data is the data I used in class last time to show you the personality structure. 
I would like you to discuss the CFI RMCA TLI flat model and then make a little table. I would like you to make a plot, like we, which we did with some plots. I would like you to compare the fit of a five factor model to a single factor model. So there are some, well, I shouldn't say crazy people, but there are some people who say there's a single factor of personality, like shyness, boldness, and they say that's a better fit to the data. So you could test that, for example, by making a single factor model and see how that five factor model stacks up to that general factor model. You can test the measurement variance for men versus women. So is personality measured the same in men and women in this uh, type of thing? And make a plot and make this measurement and value. So it should be make a table. I mean, the measurement and value is table like we did. And then discuss, do you have metric invariance, configurable variance, uh, uh, strict invariance? What type of invariance do you have between the uh, groups? So do you think the personality measure is measuring the same in men and women? And can we compare men and women on their personality scores or not? So lots of additional reading. Again, this is highlights. I've just glossed over uh, how, uh, how to do measurement invariance and how to do structural equation modeling. But if you have to do this more seriously, you're welcome to read those papers and also welcome to come and chat to me if this is something you have to do for your project, for example. Yeah. Any other questions at this stage? I might have rushed a little bit over the measurement invariance thing, so take your time to have a look and do the exercise because that will help you to sort of get a better grasp of what is happening there. That's the only thing which we didn't really practice now today in class. Any other questions? No? So uh, Alex is around to still answer some questions and like uh, to help you with your exercises. So, And next week we'll continue with structure equation models, but then we'll do something fun, which is combining structure equation models which have factors in it with regressions to build causal models or path models. So that's what we'll be doing next week. There's two more sessions after that on multi-level model, and that's the end of it. So it's really flown by.